Welcome everybody to our first keynote session of today and our second keynote of the conference. Just, those are the words that get people coming in from, you know, the outside, so good. We're very excited to have Dr. Lynn Swanner here. And as you can see, her title is Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer from the Association of Christian Schools International. Um, many of you may have met Lynn before, and we're just delighted uh, to have her share her knowledge and her expertise. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, she has two books, uh, and we do have copies of those at the table. Um, if you would like a copy of her book, uh, we just have a, a, a certain number of them, but take one. Um, if you didn't get one but want one, just go ahead and tell Michelle and Sonia and we'll order one for you and have it sent to you. Uh, what we didn't want to do is order copies of everybody's books and then find out that half of you have it already. So we wanted to be a little stewardly about that. Um, but that's what the books are for. The books are, the, are not to be sold out there. They're for, for you to have. Um, and so take advantage of us that way. Um, and uh, these, these will be available out there, a few copies. So like I said, uh, if you need one, take one. Uh, and now I am delighted to welcome Lynn to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, it is wonderful to be here. And I always say that, but I really mean it this time. Um, <laughs> No, I always really mean that. Uh, it, is, it is great. I'll, I will tell you what I always say about the Van Lunen Fellows Program, and, and this is the truth. I always say to folks when they're asking where they should be thinking about executive education, I say, whenever I find an exceptional leader in the Christian school space, nine times out of 10, they went through Van Lunen. And I mean that, and I don't quite know why. I don't know if it's there's some secret sauce. I don't know if it's the cohorts, the mentoring. Uh, but there's so many friends in this room, so many leaders that I greatly admire in this room, so many leaders that I have personally learned from in this room. And some of you show up in the books with your knowledge. Okay, I didn't, didn't, didn't write about you without your knowledge. So um, it is really, really an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, I also have been doing sort of the speaker circuit this fall. So uh, how many folks have had to struggle through a, a keynote by me already this fall? A few people, okay. <laughs> Um, so the good news is, for the most part, I'm not going to be talking about anything that I have talked about this fall. So if you heard the flourishing talk, that's not what this is about. And um, part of that is because this is something that I really wanted to create bespoke for the Van Lunen Fellows Program. Again, knowing so many friends here, knowing your caliber of leadership, knowing what you're trying to achieve with your schools, wanted to make sure that uh, I was able to give you some encouragement, but of course it will be research-based because that's, that's the way that we roll. Um, so today we'll be talking about leading future-ready Christian schools, insights and reflections from the research. Yvonne did uh, show this book. I actually brought a, a copy as well, so I'll leave this at the front table for someone to take. Um, so this is a study that we did a few years, well actually only two years ago, so I'll unpack that a little bit, but even if you've heard that, it'll be a little bit different from, from what you've heard before. So I'm going to start with uh, an introduction framing the field. And I'm going to tell you some things that you already know uh, intuitively in your bones. But I want to give you some data about what the last few years in Christian schools have looked like. And again, these are things that you know. We have faced multi-year challenges. And I want to focus on just four to start. So enrollment flux, limited reach to diverse populations, lack of innovation, and staffing shortages and burnout. Don't worry, we're going to end with keys to sustaining your leadership. <laughs> so this might sound slightly depressing, but we're going we're gonna to go up from there. So, uh, but we'll just give some, some data around this. So enrollment flux. Uh, prior to the pandemic, obviously a multi-decade decline in the number of middle class families enrolling in independent schools. This is nationwide data. It's not unique to the Christian school sector. Uh, insufficient financial aid, what we have found in our sector level surveys is that uh, at the median schools are offering less than 30% tuition. So that means that 
students that need financial assistance oftentimes are not getting as much as they need. Let's talk about the COVID bump. 35% average growth across Christian schools. This was unevenly distributed, so where we saw the most growth was schools from about 250 to about 600 students saw the higher range of that growth. Um, but 35% is huge, and we're gonna talk about that particularly when it comes to sustaining our missions. So do our, mission, do our institutions have the capacity to keep up, and is it here to stay, particularly as we start seeing an explosion of educational options. Um, so we see an explosion of school choice programs, which Patrick, Dr. Patrick Wolf's gonna probably, I'm sure we'll be talking about, um, but also hybrid schools that can take advantage of some of that, home schools, micro schools, et cetera. By the way, I've heard this framed as feast or, feast or famine. I think you've heard that kind of framed that way, sort of like Joseph in Egypt. So I don't wanna get spiritual on you, but it's interesting to, to hear some some look at that. So enrollment flux, uh, recent enrollment growth has raised new questions and challenges. How do we acculturate and support new students and families? We're going to get into that in a minute. What about staffing shortages? Is anyone here experiencing some type of staffing shortage? Just raise your hand. Okay. I was very used to the chemistry teacher loss, which always happened two weeks before school started. Like we always lost our chem teacher. I have no idea why. Uh, it was just a, just a pattern, but now it's, it's pretty systemic. Uh, and by the way, I was in Australia this summer, their fall, they're experiencing it also all over Canada. So it really is uh, an extensive issue. With all this growth, will it be sustained in the long term? If not, how can we prepare for future fluctuations now? So I want to introduce a metaphor to you. I am not a, a sports person. We heard the president of Calvin last night mention American football and then football for the rest of the world. Uh, so my analogy is going to be an American football analogy. So um, is everybody familiar? Who's familiar with the term blocking and tackling? OK. I'm not, because I'm not a sports fan, but this is what sports people tell me. OK. Blocking and tackling, in essence, means stick to the basics and deliver results. Right, so blocking and tackling are apparently the corner, so it's probably hilarious for you to hear a non-sports person <laughs> explain this. But, you know, I like humor, so. Um, blocking and tackling apparently are the core actions you need to do in football in order to win games. And so blocking and tackling means if you do those well consistently over time, you will win. So I've heard this a lot in the Christian school space. So if we block and tack well, if we do enrollment management well, if we do marketing well, if we do strategic planning well, and all of those things are incredibly important. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't do those well. In fact, I know that you do them well. But here's the issue with blocking and tackling. Blocking and tackling works really well when you have a level playing field. When you have things spaced out by 10 yards, Yes, no, oh, yes, okay, my husband would be proud. <laughs> 10 yards, um, when wherever you travel, it looks like this, right? In fact, I think there's quite hefty fines if you go to a field and it doesn't look like this in the NFL, I would assume, um, and so it works really well. Here's the issue, I think it could be argued that what I'm about to say is not true, which I would probably accept that, but let's, let's say that for a lot of times in Christian education, we, we were playing on something that looked like a level field. I'm talking you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, this is a little bit more like what it looks like today. So this is an MC Escher painting. Um, you're not really sure which way you're going. Um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm probably the age of most of, these peop most of the people in the room. When I'm dealing with younger folks, I'll usually be like, you know, like the Marvel Universe, the Mirror Universe, <laughs> if I had to explain that to my kids, um, you know, or the movie Inception. Like this is probably a fairly accurate description of what the last three to four years have been in your school. And so what I'd love you to do is turn to folks at your table and just briefly discuss in what ways is Christian school leadership today more like navigating the MC Escher painting than playing on an NFL regulated football field. Go.
Okay, you have about another minute. Okay, let me pull us back together. I could, I could tell from the conversation that this question didn't resonate with anyone and you had no answers and it's just been absolutely smooth sailing the last few years. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, just popcorn style, what are some of the things that you mentioned? Don't, don't say it more than like three or four words. What were some of the things? Just yell it out. Some of the things that make it more challenging. Parent, ooh, in, I've never had it in unison. That was amazing. That, that table has won. Okay, others, just yell them out. Let's see if we can do, do that again. That's great. Trust. trust, okay, who's trust? Parents trust, wonderful. Okay, not wonderful, but yeah. Okay, trust, other things. Sorry? Lack of civility, yes. Huge polarization. Others. Student academic deficiencies. Yeah, student academic deficiencies who's coming in. Yes. Others. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Student mental health, faculty and staff mental health. Your mental health. Dare we talk about that? Anyone else? Challenges to school culture. Yes, anything specific coming to mind? Uh, no, it's getting more and more folks who don't come with understanding. Yes. Traditional schools have certain challenges. Yeah, great. We're going to touch on that in a bit. Excellent. Um, we're going to, yeah, we're going we're gonna to look at some data in that in a minute. Um, before we do that, as we move on, and remember, we're trying to get to a hopeful note at the end. Um, I just want to give a really quick background on this research. Um, who really enjoys research in this room? Raise your hand. Okay, you're going to be really disappointed and depressed with what I'm going to share. Um, so we'll, we'll chat in a bit afterwards, maybe at lunch, um, or read, you can read the book. Um, but I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what this, uh, what this research tried to do and how it was structured. So we had a very uh, sizable grant set of grants, which we were very uh, grateful for from CECT McClellan and also a private family foundation. We did this work in partnership with CARDIS. In fact, almost all of us were CARDIS senior fellows who worked on it. And we wanted to look at innovative models and structures in Christian schools that address sustainability and increase access to Christian schooling. That was the purpose of the study. That's what we wanted to do. So we started actually in January of 2020, which is a fun time to start any research project, because uh, we all know what happened in March. Um, so, uh, but we started that then, and we developed a two-year project using an appreciative inquiry framework that actually started in Canada and the US that CARDIS has helped to pioneer. We also did a quantitative survey of all the schools involved. And we have had a peer-reviewed publication come out from it. So that's just some quick background. Again, happy to talk with you about the methodology at lunch. Our study goals were to identify, again, innovative Christian school financial and structural models that contribute to long-term sustainability while expanding educational access. And those were the twin goals to that. We wanted to also look at key changes, uh, change processes, practices, and conditions that are important to innovating. Some of you will, or if not all of you, will have this experience where you see something wonderful at one school. You say, let's do that at our school, and what often happens, right? Uh, because you can't always transplant something that works in one school into another because your soil is different. Your DNA is different. And so we were trying to understand some of the underlying conditions that led to innovation and sustainability, not just a how-to manual, for example. Here's how to start a micro school. There are plenty of people out there that will tell you how to do that. That was not our goal. Our goal was to understand how do we actually create soil in which a micro school can flourish. Uh, identify key barriers or challenges to implementing innovative models and look at leadership dispositions, so all of you, that contribute to success in implementing innovative 
models. So we identified 11 schools, very diverse schools in terms of where they're located, in terms of their, what associations they belong to, in terms of their admissions policies, their sizes, what their demographic makeup, socioeconomic makeup looks like. And so I'm just gonna flash some of them on the screen here. Uh, so I was only able to fit nine pictures on here, so there are two more, uh, but just to give you a sense of, of what they look like, uh, Cincinnati uh, Christian School, uh, uh, sorry, Cincinnati Hills Christian Academy, we have Linden Christian Schools, Open Sky Education, Hope Academy, the City School in Philadelphia, we have Joel Gaines with us, Oaks Christian School, California, Christian School Association of Greater Harrisburg, Grand Rapids Christian School, and I actually, this picture, I'm gonna go into this in a little bit later, but does this, does this look familiar? Yes. Yeah, so we actually have the architect, uh, Peter, with us, and I have to tell you, walking around the school and seeing the architecture, and we, we really talk about it in the book, and the intentionality around integrating the community and also the history of all the schools that had become part of Grand Rapids was, was um, very powerful. And so it's pretty cool to be able to meet the architect who was a partner in that. Uh, Chattanooga Christian School. So um, I'll unpack some of these models in a little bit, but really looking for themes across all of them. And this is the main theme, and it's going to be really hard for you to read, especially if you're on this side of the, the, side of the um, room. But I'll tell you the top line research finding, and then you can probably walk out and get coffee, and you don't have to read the book, because I told you what the, uh, what the, what the bottom line is. But here, here's what we found. The challenges to Christian school sustainability are complex and systemic. The models and structures that have historically characterized Christian schooling appear increasingly inadequate to handle these challenges. If sustainability is defined as maintaining the way Christian schools currently operate, these challenges can appear insurmountable. However, a powerful means of moving forward involves redefining sustainability as ensuring that your school's mission continues into the future instead of preserving the way schools look and function today. Viewing sustainability from this missional versus institutional perspective can prove generative not only for finding innovative solutions to these challenges, but also for transforming them into opportunities for mission-driven growth. So I'm gonna unpack this a little bit, but we start in the book by framing it as, what do we love? And if you know, of course, this starts all the way back with Augustine, uh, you know, Jamie Smith, uh, have done work around this, which is how are we ordering our desires? And for institutions, it is very tempting, in fact, institutions over time tend to bend in this direction, fall in love oftentimes not with their mission, but with the way that they deliver on the mission. That's a challenge because times will change, right? So, um, and for our mission to be continued into the future, do we love our mission, the one who gave it to us, more than we say, whatever the sacred cow is at your school, and you know what it is, <laughs> um, that, folks, uh, that folks don't want to give up, or the way that teachers uh, work at your school, et cetera. And so um, in our research, we found three major categories for these innovative schools where they were kind of pushing the boundaries. So the first was mission and culture, structures and practices, and people and community. So these are the ways that they were innovating to meet their mission. So for mission and culture, and again, this is very high level talking through what some of the findings were. Um, ooh, what happened? Uh-oh. I didn't touch anything, I promise. There we go. Thank you, Lord. OK. Um, mission and culture. So the first was to be distinctive. Know what your mission is. Have crystal clarity on that. That is what sets you apart. That is what sets you apart. Be relevant. If you know what your mission is, then you can adjust your methods to be relevant to your community, to your families, et cetera. And then be inclusive, and by that I mean whatever your admissions policy is, do not hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying change your admissions policy, okay, or your student manual. Whatever it is, there are students and there are families 
who are not at your school who are mission appropriate. How can you get them there? Right, particularly when we think about students with disabilities. Um, and we'll, we'll unpack this a little bit as we go on. Structures and practices, resourcing creatively, taking advantage of school choice programs, third source income, entrepreneurship programs, reimagining structures. So one of the um, case studies in the book is on uh, two schools that are separated by a large river in Pennsylvania, and they don't generally draw from the same population groups, but they merge to form a district. So they have all their back office and a lot of their teacher training, et cetera, to be shared. Take disciplined risks. Um, John Eckert always talks about this as um, if you repeatedly fail, um, you're actually just failing. <laughs> Uh, and that you know, we tend to glorify failure, uh, but the, the goal is to, to learn from failure. And so how do we take disciplined risks um, so that we're making small risks, and so if we fail, we can learn from it versus we've, we've bet the whole farm on it. Um, so lots of pilots and trying different things out. People and community, prioritizing people. This is particularly our faculty, paying them a living wage would, is, is challenging, but to make sure that we're doing that. Um, Valor Christian um, in uh, Denver has a campus pastor uh, who cares for, for their folks in addition to a student pastor. Inviting partners, um, the city school is excellent at this and actually you'll, you'll hear uh, Dan and Joel talk a little bit later about this, but having uh, community partners that not only are meeting the needs of the school, but you get to be a neighbor. You get to love our neighbor, right? We're called not only to the Great Commission, but to the Great Commandment, right? We need to love our neighbor as ourselves, And then finally, uh, sharing innovation, so that when you as a school develop something that's unique to be able to share that with other schools, and this program certainly enables you to, to do that. Okay, so those are the top level findings from the schools that we looked at. So in qualitative terms, these are the themes, the emergent themes. I had to say that for Patrick, right? <laughs> so he's got that. Okay, let's transition to what are some leadership keys for sustaining our school's mission. So that's an overview of the study. What are some keys? And there are gonna be four keys that we're going to unpack. What are things that we saw leaders doing? What are some of the implications for you as a leader? And then as you work with your teams, what are some of the things that you can work with them to develop in order to have sustained excellence at your Christian school into the future? So, our four leadership keys are all contained in this sentence. In order to sustain our school's missions, we need resilient leaders who are reconcilers, reinvestors, and reimaginers for the future. So we need resilient leaders, that's the first one, who are reconcilers, reinvestors, and reimaginers for the future. So I'm going to unpack each of these using some data to give you some definitions and talk about what these keys are. So let's start with leaders. By the way, I'll throw that slide up again at the end if you missed it. So leaders who are resilient. Let's look at the data that's out there. Staffing shortages and burnout. And again, we're gonna go, we're gonna dip into the depression zone again. High turnover in leadership and lower compensation than other sectors. That's just a reality. That's what we've seen in Christian schools. Um, Jay and I wrote a, a, a blog and a report about this. Uh, we just see this as a reality. We have higher turnover and lower compensation in the Christian school sector. Widespread stress among Christian school leaders and teachers. We found this in our flourishing schools research back in 2019. What had not happened in 2019? COVID, right? So this was a reality back then, and COVID in a lot of ways has blown open cracks that were already in existence. During COVID, we did a sector level, we actually did three sector level surveys of Christian education. And consistently, we saw the top two concerns that leaders reported was number one, overwork for teachers and staff, and number two, mental health of leaders, faculty, and staff. Those were the top two concerns. We gave a list and people were able to pick their top three, excuse me. So during COVID, this, this was huge. Might I submit to you that things may have moved on, but this is the moment where some of the things that you're seeing in your community may actually be post-traumatic responses. So if you have people, and my, my background's in mental health, um, so I have my, my master's and I used to teach in a program uh, in mental health, 
Um, but that people were sort of stretched to, to the edge and that it's sort of like um, you'll see folks on their last straw and you'll see a response either in a teacher or a student or a family that just comes out of left field. I would, I would submit to you that that could actually be a traumatic response. That folks are starting to sort of relax, let themselves you know, relax a little bit and that finding out that they've been in this sort of fight, flight, or freeze mode for quite some time. And I'm hearing a lot of reports of that. So this is not over, is my main, my main point there. And in a survey that we fielded in late 2022, roughly two-fifths of surveyed school leaders reported staffing shortages. I think that's even higher now in 2023 from what I've, what I've heard. So significant staffing shortages. So let's get back to how do you become resilient in the face of some of these issues that you're dealing with. Um, this may be somebody that you know, I hope, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, God in the dock, this is what he says, none can give to another what he does not possess himself. No generation can bequeath to its successor what it has not got. Nothing which was not in the teachers can flow from them into the pupils. I showed this in the UK, by the way, and I had an audible gasp um, the first response was, oh, you know who C.S. Lewis is? And then the second response was, you still read in the US? Um, so yeah, that was a fun, fun one. Um, but it's essentially, we see this also in the research, right? When you have a stressed out, burned out teacher that actually negatively impacts students' academic gains. When we have, te when we have principals, particularly that are stressed out, there's higher turnover and that impacts uh, students' gains as well. So we want to talk about developing personal resilience. And I'm talking about this for you as a leader. I'm also talking about as you lead your teams. So this may be hard to see, but there's like a gazillion models of resilience out there, by the way. You can just Google them. And I mean, it, uh, throw them all together, mash it up. It, it's just good to have a conversation around resilience. So things like personal mission and values. Is there alignment for you, your teachers, your staff, your leaders with the school? Alignment to the workplace. Social involvement. There's something called the, the circle of five, where you need five significant relationships to be mentally healthy, and at least one of them needs to be at work. Emotion management. Who is having issues with parents and students and teachers having difficulties with emotion management? Just raise your hand. Okay. Again, I think that's related to some of the trauma that we've seen. Um, problem solving approach that could be constructive or destructive in a lot of ways. How do we deal with problems? Concentration and focus. Anyone having issues with that with students? Concentration and focus. Okay. Uh, some folks. Some schools are trying to take cell phones away. I hear that helps, uh, but a lot of concentration issues. And then, of course, physical well being. So here's uh, three things you need to think about. We're going to pivot to you as a leader. How do you become a resilient leader? Number one, are you assessing yourself on these? I encourage you at some point today when you go home to do a self-assessment. How are you doing on all these? You can do a simple Likert scale, one to five. Um, five is I'm doing amazing, and one is I'm not even hanging on, okay? So whatever, you, if, you, if you want seven, you can do one to seven, whatever it is. But just assess yourself on, we can have an argument about which is the best type of of, of Likert scale. I tend to like one to four because it's forced choice, but whatever. Okay, so um, you can just do a self-assessment and see uh, kind of where you're at on this. The second is practices, what, and we're gonna talk about one in a minute. What practices, what habits do you have in place in your schedule and the life of your school to help support development of resilience? And the last is accountability. I had the honor of speaking at the SCSBC uh, Board and Leadership Conference um, over the weekend. I don't even know what city I'm in right now because um, I've been traveling so much. But I actually got to speak to 60, 65 board members at once. I've never had that opportunity. I've only been able to speak to boards at individual schools, sometimes to do interventions. And I bring that up because I hope your board is keeping you accountable for your well-being. I really do. Um, I hope they're talking with you about taking a sabbatical. Um, if they're not, tell them that they should talk to me and I'll talk to them about it. Um, 
So how, what accountability do you have? It could be to a spouse, it could be to a colleague, hopefully it's your board keeping you accountable for your well-being. Just to share some research um, that actually uh, a colleague of, of Patrick Wolfs and two doctoral students, both of whom have worked for ACSI, put this uh, peer-reviewed article out, a cross-sectional analysis of the relationship between Sabbath practices and US, Canadian, Indonesian, where is Mark, there you go, uh, and Paraguayan teachers burnout. And this is what they found. We consistently estimate a statistically significant inverse relationship between Sabbath keeping and burnout, okay? So what happens at Christian schools is that at Christian schools where there's some type of Sabbath practice going on, so, and that, that's not a legalistic kind of thing. It's like, do you have a Sabbath policy? Are you not having meetings on Sunday nights? Are you not sending emails? Whatever it looks like, whether there's a policy or there's practices, individual practices of teachers and leaders, burnout is significantly lower at the Christian school. Okay, this ought not to shock us because God has built into the created order a Sabbath. He knows what's best for us. As leaders, we often fail to observe that. And again, not being legalistic, whatever that looks like. So as you go back to your school, think about do you have a Sabbath policy? What are your own personal practices around this? Because it is highly correlated with reduced burnout. And that's just one practice. There could be other practices, you know, time, free time during the day, going for a walk, exercise, etc. Okay, let's move on. Leaders who are reconcilers. So we have resilient. Now we're moving to reconcilers. Um, this might be hard to see. Uh, this is actually public school data. Percentages of district leaders who agreed or strongly agreed political polarization surrounding various issues was interfering with their ability to educate students in 2022-2023 by topic and subgroup. So um, the darker color is all districts. The blue is blue districts, right? So it's more of a democratic. Purple is kind of mixed, right? Which is what Texas is starting to look like. Bad news um, for some might think that. And then red is, a, is very like a conservative Republican kind of district, right? Look at this. And the first is LGBTQ issues. The second is critical race theory. And the third is COVID safety or vaccines. So these are issues that district leaders are saying political polarization, not the issue itself, but political polarization around these is actually interfering with their ability to, um, to educate. So you might sit there and say, oh, well, that's, that's fine. That's public schools. Well, guess where that 35% of students who just came to your school came from? Sometimes the folks who are fleeing something are a bit more scary than the folks who are desiring what you have to offer, okay? So these folks are, are importing this, uh, if it's not already in your school, which I'm sure it already is. Um, NAIS, right? Research, in the research, you might have seen this if your school is an NAIS school, how polarization affects independent school communities. Leading up to and following the 2016 election, NAIS increasingly heard from its members about discord and conflict among school communities, even the youngest students. The rancor only increased in the wake of the pandemic, racial reckoning, and subsequent intense scrutiny of K-12 education. In their survey in 2021, just 23% of heads reported feeling very prepared to address and manage community polarization. 25% the next year ranked pol political polarization as one of the top three challenging aspects of their headships. So this is happening, obviously, in our schools as well. Um, this is another survey, principles bearing the brunt of political polarization. Um, they are the buffer for a lot of this. And the bottom paragraph is interesting. School leaders cite that pol politicization, am I saying that right? Politic politicization as a main reason for thinking about leaving their jobs. OK. The bottom line also say, one of these says that this is actually if you look at the second paragraph right here, most commonly from parents, especially in more affluent majority white schools. Guess what? <laughs> Many Christian schools are majority white affluent schools. And uh, we consistently, in, when you look across our sector, um, rank much lower than other types of schools in terms of our inclusion of students from different race, ethnicity, and school type. And by the way, coming soon, just a quick news flash, in case anybody <laughs> hasn't clocked that. Um, 
Looking forward to that? Because <laughs> the first one was so peaceful and really brought unity in churches and uh, in our Christian schools. So if you're not doing something to think about this and how you prepare your school community, you really ought to be. You really ought to be, because by all, uh, all accounts, this is going to be round two of whatever that looked like. So um, be thinking about that for your school. I want to commend to you the work of the Colossian Forum. I know they're here, and they've done um, some workshops, or will be doing some workshops. But um, they really have developed some, some incredible practices around this, how you can help your, your teachers, your leaders, uh, build a community that not only um, doesn't um, fall apart at conflict, but actually uses that as part of the process of being human and how we can actually transform that to build our communities. There are others out there, but certainly I would recommend to you the Colossian form. Okay, leaders who are reinvestors. I heard this quote the other day from a school leader, and I want to read it to you. COVID and the culture wars kicked my if you'd asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have wished it on anyone. It's only in the last six months that I can see what God did through that time in me and my school, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. This reminds me of Romans 8.28, right? That God will work all things together for good. It's interesting. I, I wanted to, I was thinking about sharing a bit um, at this conference on um, kin, uh, kintsuji. Has anybody heard of that Japanese practice? Yeah. And I was like, ah, I don't have time, which honestly, looking at the time, I don't. But um, this is a display. I took a picture of this on the way here because this is actually a display in the Philadelphia airport. I don't know if the, our Philly friends saw it. Um, but So this is an artist who um, actually takes these plates, and then the plates are purposely broken and pieced back together using lacquer and gold leaf in a manner that emulates the Japanese art of kintsugi. And so it's, it's absolutely beautiful, and there's a whole wall of them in the Philly airport. And the idea of us being part of God's story, where he takes what's broken and puts it back together, and it's somehow more beautiful, um, that that is key for us. So when we talk about leaders as reinvestors, here are a couple of questions that we don't have um, time necessarily to go through. But I'd love for you to take a picture of it and maybe chat about it um, after lunch, I might actually give you a minute to do it. Uh, but how have you and your school grown in depth, not just in numbers through the past three years? How have you grown? And then as a leader, how will you reinvest the resilience that God has developed you over the past three years? I think these are critical questions. Like if you walk away with nothing else from this presentation, please take these back and think about these. How have you grown? How has your school grown? And I'm not talking about numbers. And how are you going to reinvest your resilience? May I make a suggestion here? There are, we're, we're not going to be at this for, for much longer, <laughs> OK? Um, and however much time we think we have, it's probably less than we think we have. It really is critical to be reinvesting in that next generation of leaders. How are you going to be the one who tells the good works of the Lord to the next generation? How are you raising up that next generation? How are you going to reinvest what arguably has been the worst three to four years in modern Christian school leadership? How can you reinvest that? How can you not let that go to, raise, to waste? I would suggest that it, it might be in training that next generation. So take some time to think about this uh, when, you, when you go home. And finally, leaders who are reimaginers. This is our final uh, bit that we'll get to. So we found um, that historically, Christian schools have been slow to implement and identify innovative and research-based practices. So this was actually, um, this was pre-COVID, but percentage of schools offering innovative programs, and by the way, we had a really big list, so it would be really hard to not pick something on that list. I mean, we even had like gifted and talented, after school programs, I mean, a huge list. And 67% uh, of Christian schools did not offer, and only a third did. Our data during COVID and after COVID said that the vast majority, something in the 80 to 90 percent of schools that had developed something innovative during COVID were going to stop it after COVID. So I'm not necessarily seeing that some of the things that were developed during COVID really were emergency measures versus long-term innovations. I love this cartoon. Um, in the middle, you see comprehensive reform. You could call that change. And then we've got these two guys. We prefer tinkering at the edges. 
And that is a lot of what we do in schools. We tinker at the edges. We change the schedule. We change this program. We offer an institute, right? So, but the question becomes, how do we actually become reimaginers of what education will look like into the future? You heard the president of Calvin last night say, we're not going to need professors, right? Like, we actually need to think along those lines because we probably are not going to have enough teachers for the next 10, 15 something years. What is that going to look like? So um, I'm just going to quickly note what some of these schools do in their innovations. Uh, so we have Linden Christian Schools has a, a greenhouse, community greenhouse. They have a thrift store, which brings in $500,000 a year. It's not insignificant, insignificant, all volunteers. Um, Open Sky Education opens up charter schools, public charter schools, and then provides Christian wraparound programs. They do like 85 other things, but I don't have time to explain that. Hope Academy in Minneapolis has a flipped um, model for um, funding their school. So what they do is actually they have, instead of having big donors, they have essentially a sponsor a child model. And so they educate um, a lot of uh, urban, urban students who aren't able to afford their education. Oaks Christian, they have their idea lab. They partner with the Jet Propulsion. You've probably heard of Oaks Online. Um, quite a few things, Institute Cincinnati. Hills Christian Academy, uh, their innovation and entrepreneurship program, sustainability program. This is a coffee shop that pulls in net $50,000 a year. It's entirely student run. The city school, so this is a, 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 actually a mural on their wall of an African proverb. If you want to go fast, actually, do you want to say it? Can you say it? You're here. What's the proverb? Say the proverb. Come on, man. Help me out here. I got like 60 seconds left. Oh, come on. You know it. <laughs> Yes. Um, Joel was like a couple of years younger, and he wasn't a school leader in this picture. So you still look good, man, but I'm just saying, you know, um, what school leadership will do to you is uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, but, but all the partnerships, and I encourage you to talk with Joel about the partnerships that they do, the innovative things they do to be a light in, in the city, which is actually their, their motto. I mentioned um, Christian School Association of Greater Harrisburg. I mentioned Grand Rapids Christian Schools, which of course they also do inclusion of students with disabilities. Uh, Chattanooga Christian School, uh, three micro schools, which we cover in the book. We're gonna do a case study on them uh, after lunch, so I won't go into them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, kind of close, close with this. Um, big questions. I think there are big questions we need to be asking ourselves in our schools. So you can take a picture of this and we'll, We'll end up this because I know I'm standing between you and lunch. What will it mean to be human? AI and bioethics, we heard that, right? How will education move toward personalization and choice facilitated by new technologies? So we have hybrid online access. How will geopolitical shifts impact North America? Markets and supply chains, wars and rumors of war. So I'm doing a program at Side Business School of Oxford, at Oxford University, and you would have thought that these folks were, the, were like the most conspiratorial wing of, of the conservative U.S. Christian sector, okay? They are literally saying, these are, these are economists, these are people who know what they're talking about, that geopolitical shifts with China and Russia are going to be cataclysmic. So I was not a conspiracy panic person before, but I went to Oxford University, came back, and I'm a little freaked out by it. Um, so markets and supply chains, things that we take for granted, they're going to be massive shifts. And by the way, this was prior to October 7th with the events in the Middle East. What will the next iteration of Christ and culture be in North America? Is uh, folks familiar with Richard Niebuhr? Just raise your hand, right? I would encourage you to go back and read that book. There's been a few other books and commentaries that have come out which are really great because they make it a little more complex than they complexify what he, he says. But this is really the challenge, I think, for us right now. How do we understand Christ and culture? We can use his models to understand that. And, 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 and my question is always, do we, to what degree do we get to choose? Can we exercise choice in that? So I want to close with this. Um, those are our four leadership keys if you wanted to get another picture of that, if it's all right. Um, are folks familiar with the, the prayer of Oscar Romero? OK. You may have done this before as a practice, but um, when I give this presentation, I think it's hard for folks to not walk away 
overwhelmed at times. Actually, I think 10 minutes at your school, you probably want to walk away overwhelmed. Um, and this prayer was introduced to me a few years ago, and I think is a really good centering for me. And so I'd love for us to, if we can, stand together. And let's, hopefully folks can see this. Um, if not, you can kind of flub the words, <laughs> I guess. Um, but let's, let's read this together, and as we do, Let's really commit to the Lord the future of our schools because ultimately we're responsible stewards, right? But we know who holds the future. It's the Lord, but we know the one who holds the future. So we'll read this together. The Romero Prayer. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church or the school's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future that is not our own. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. It's always amazing to me. Um, I, I had just come across this prayer and it had incorporated into Saturday's worship. And, and, you know, it's just amazing that God brought this in both of our hearts uh, in front of you today. So uh, we're going to have lunch now. What we're going to do is we're going to go out into the fireside room, take your lunch, and bring it into white pine maple. Don't bring it back into here because we're coming back in here. We don't want to see your lunch crumbs all over the tablecloth. So, so just take it and bring it over there. And because we ended this session with prayer, we could just go ahead and start eating when, you, when you're seated. Thank you.